Hello Nigeria, hello Africa. You're watching Plus TV Africa and the program is Sports Business with Orufo Ezaga. Today we're going to be talking sports business as usual. You know it's Tuesday, weekends are for entertainment, Tuesdays for sports business. And today we have a loaded package for you. In the studio with me is um, Mr. Victor Unduka Uba. Unduka Uba, yeah. He's the Deputy Managing Director of AfriInvest West Africa. Now, we're going to learn from him two things. One, we're going to find out from, he, from his wealth of experience in investment banking, what we need to do in the Nigerian sports industry to attract the sort of investments we need to grow um, the sports industry in Nigeria. And then also, we're going to be talking to him about his company's role in sports in Nigeria. They already have gotten into the, you know, well, into the industry in, in basically getting their hands dirty to try and get the sports industry where it should um, get to, to the lofty place it should get to, as shared sponsors of Nigeria champions, Enugu Rangers. Now, sports is big business. We can't say that enough on this program. And what you're going to be hearing today, if you are a sports investor or a sports uh, entrepreneur, is what you need to do to ensure that you maximize your investment in, in the industry. Um, but before we get started, I have Mr. Nduka Oba in the studio, but before we get started, we're going to take a very short break. And um, one minute, no more. Keep the dial on Plus TV Africa when we return. The business begins. Welcome back to the program Sports Business with Uru 4 Ezaga. We're reaching you from Plus TV Africa live from our studios in Lagos. I'm a, uh, today we're going to be talking sports investment and in the studio with me is Mr. Unduka Uba, Victor Unduka Uba, who is the Deputy Managing Director of Afri Invest West Africa Limited. Hello, Victor. You're welcome to the program. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Okay. Ah, it's you I should be thanking. <laughs> <laughs> because it's you. We want, we want to drill your brain and get as much as we can from you this afternoon. All right. Um, so, look. Do you get a sense that the sports industry in Nigeria is beginning to, um, to maybe grow in a different direction, the right direction? Um, well, when you say sports, generally, I, I think um, you know, it, it goes beyond, it, it, there are several facets to it. Okay. Um, perhaps the response would be there are green shoots in several areas. Okay. Um, I think basketball, we've seen some exciting things happening there mm. with FIBA mm. um, and, and some of the talent that uh, the Basketball Federation is able to attract now to play for Nigeria, mm. um, especially um, diaspora Nigerians who are exposed to better facilities and training in the US. Mm. So that's positive. Um, the Nigerian football um, is also beginning to um, see some investments by private sector participants um, and that is also beginning to tell on the league. Um, there's increased focus by the NFF to try and improve things and the league body itself. Um, so to, to that extent, um, especially with respect to the male football league, I think there's okay. been some improvements and mm -hmm. there are green shoots there as well. Um, I was following the um, Africa Bas uh, Table Tennis Championships as well. Okay. Um, so there's some little, you know, improvements we're beginning to see, um, but I still think there is quite a lot of uh, room for improvement across board. You know, several areas. You know, powerlifting, weightlifting, Paralympics. Um, you know, sports generally can be a lot more lucrative, but um, I think these are still very early days. Mm -hmm. Very early days. Okay, but here's the thing that you said that I, I think that. Um interests me personally. It is the fact that the private sector is beginning to look into the industry. It's still, it's still sort of passive attention, so to speak, but we're getting something. You know, um, an investment banking firm is involved in the league. Um, you guys are involved in some way uh, in the league as well. And so I imagine that um, the, the sports sector or sports entrepreneurs should now be looking and saying, 
Okay, so maybe we have the attention of the, of the investment community. Would I be right in saying that? Well, yes and no. Um, so to some degree, yeah. um, whatever attention the, the community is getting today is mm. perhaps born more out of CSR mm. than out of a direct business investment. Mm. Um, however, I think that is only a stepping stone towards you know, making it a full-blown commercial enterprise. Mm. Um, but be as it may, I, I think just getting involved as well, even if it's at the CSR level because you're trying to, or corporates are trying to see how they can impact society and community and you know, get young people actively engaged in some productive venture, um, you know, that itself begins to open their eyes into other areas um, where they can intervene. Um, either through funding or through introducing, you know, structure and governance um, or process, as it were, to improve the odds of success overall, both for, you know, participants, for stakeholders, and even the youth themselves. Well, this is an industry that has been, that has been um, prioritized by the more progressive economies of our world, right? And this is for decades, right? So clearly, there's something happening in that space. Uh, we, we saw China try to muscle in. Now it's Saudi Arabia that's muscling in. What are these guys seeing that we're not seeing? Because for instance, um, some searches will tell you that um, economists would say that sports contribute about 1% to a country's GDP, and even more to jobs. And as a matter of fact, the study that was done by, by the EU as of 2021 showed that sports contributed um, about 2.12% to the region's GDP and, uh, and about 2.72% to, to jobs, right? So it is happening. People, when I hear you speak, I, I, I remember reading about stuff that, that hearing you speak takes me back to America of 1980. Do you understand? They were there in 1980. They have gone 44 years ahead now. You know, why are we still in 1980? What, <laughs> what, because I know we can blame the government, we can blame the federations, but innovation should say that in the private sector, you know, people should look at this and say, where is the opportunity? You know, it looks like there's some opportunities. Do you get a sense that the, private, the investment community even thinks that there's an opportunity, or they know that there's an opportunity, but they don't feel the environment is right for it? That's a very loaded question. Um, but I'll, I will attempt to answer. Mm. I think, um, you know, when, when we look at some of what has happened in the developed world, like you mentioned, mm. you, you cited EU, you cited mm. the US, um, those economies are advanced for a reason. Mm. Um, we often talk about, for example, um, you know, rule of law. That is one almost invisible element to the business environment that helps shape investment. Um, if you have a legal system where whenever there are disputes, you can't categorically call, make a judgment call as to timelines for resolution, you know, then you find that um, it doesn't lend itself to investments. And that's part of the challenge we have in mm. Africa. Mm. Um, our legal systems are, um, they run on almost manual, analog, you know, if at all technology. Most times it's very manual, paper-based processes um, that impinge on disputes. And mm. with sports particularly, you can afford to have, for example, uh, let's say a football player has a contract dispute with his club, you know, how does this seek redress? Does he go to the courts? How long would it take? You know, if he has to go through the entire legal system, can he afford the service of a lawyer? Mm -hmm. You know, so those sort of things um, impact on, on sports generally. But, but I think just sort of coming back to the question, which is where we are today seems to be, you know, 44 years, 45 years behind where US was this time then. Um, I, I think their own, their own path to sports development was basically hinged on collegiate or school sports. Um, so whether it is, you know, the very popular uh, American football, which, you know, is a variant of rugby, or it's basketball, or it's baseball, um, starting kids early and having um, huge local community following around 
those um, you know, uh, activities meant that they could monetize at that local level. Um, and when you look at the economics and the size and contribution of collegiate sports, it's actually mm -hmm. bigger than professional sports in the US. And the reason is simple. Um, first of all, the US is a large country mm. um, that is wealthy on average when you look at per capita income, per capita GDP. Mm. Um, you know, so that helps in the sense that when you have Nigerians, for example, who emigrate to the US and they settle in and their kids, because again, there's something about the African bill that makes them sort of naturally yeah. amenable to sports and yeah. they get, act, get involved in active sports early. Mm. Um, what you find is that at the very low levels in the community levels in the counties um, you find college sports and there's an there's a proper structure to how those games happen you know um, and progressively there's there's local tv coverage um, there's 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 support from local companies who sponsor some of those local community you know championships and and competitions um, whether it's swimming you know you name it ice skating mm. um, so all of that local investment by local corporates into local community sports is what builds the ecosystem for talent pipeline through the system mm. or through the ranks and ultimately by the time you're then getting towards you know the second half you know high school towards the end and looking at college then there are, there are the odds that some people can have a free ride through college on the back of sports or mm. whatever it is they can do mm. you know um, we are very far from that today um, if anything, um, a lot of our schools, secondary schools, don't even have playing fields. Um, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where the argument kind of made against the private sector because for whatever reasons, we've sort of abdicated the responsibility of the public sector, in this case government, with, on or with education to the private sector. So you have more private schools where the resources are not even there to invest in the right infrastructure mm -hmm. so they don't have playgrounds or sports grounds or fields as it were and so people buy property and just convert it into schools but, and but all of that dovetails yeah, yeah but we still have we still have um okay so i was going to say we still had schools with these fields right um but then there's really i think what we have lost is the culture of sports has been fundamental to a well-rounded education right as well as that. as to our civilization as a matter of fact yeah so i don't see that we pay these days maybe we, we would rather go for for is it parties or uh, vigils and stuff like that people don't and so as as a result we miss all of those values that sports And I, and we can see today the, um, the thinking that you have to win at all costs. You know, if we were people who were into sports, we know. Look, the fact that you have lost today does not mean you can't. You know, you can't bounce back the next day. It teaches you collaboration. I remember I was at um, the national stadium with these young kids, maybe 10, 11. Um, the, bo the brother and the sister they were with their father. It was a swimming competition, and this boy of ten was already planning and saying, "You know what? I want to I want to swim the last lap. Let this guy swim the first lap. This one is faster. This one is slower. Problem solving skills, collaboration. Um, you know, you need to understand to understand why there are rules and why you should follow the rules and stuff like that. These are things missing from our society. So now we have ended up with." <laughs> we have ended up with all of the problems we have today that I feel sports can mitigate, you know, uh, clearly. But for the business sector, I'm not going to let you go, let you off the hook like, like that. Do you get If we want the public sector to invest in sports, does it, wouldn't it help if the private sector, you know, um, becomes like the catalyst so you, you you see the opportunity you see that guys like you are making a lot of money from these things in other countries why why should i why should you be exonerated so it's 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 not a straight and simple narrative as you okay. suggested businesses exist for one reason mm. to deliver shared value yeah now what is shared value a member of 
a society. A business is there to solve a problem first mm -hmm. and hoping that in solving that problem, it gets the economic returns to make it a going concern and sustainably grow. It creates jobs. Mm -hmm. It pays taxes, which mm -hmm. should then help create infrastructure that supports society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now, in speaking about sports and talking about the opportunity, I would rather flip the question and ask, is there really an opportunity in Nigeria for sports? Yeah. And the reason why I ask that question is, there is, there is the activity of sports, mm -hmm. and then there's the business of sports. Yeah. The activities can happen, but if the purchasing power of the people is too poor to support those activities, then it's not quite a business. Uh -huh. okay, so right? Now, you know where I'm going, right? You can go where I'm going. So, let, and I will use football, for example. Okay. The Nigerian League, once upon a time, going back to the 70s and 80s, and mm -hmm. even maybe in the 90s, mm -hmm. you know, because I used to follow, you know, clubs around, you know, National, mm -hmm. Ranchers Bees, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Insurance of Benin, mm -hmm. up until the 90s. But you find that progressively, as the economy got decimated, as SAP, you know, and all of the consequences of SAP, military rule, and people got poorer, the propensity to want to spend money to leave your home to go watch a football game reduced. Crime increased, and with crime insecurity, so you can't, unfortunately, talk about sports and active sports, you know, a, a sports economy with some of those factors. And I think it's the economics that speaks. So businesses are rational institutions. They will put capital where they believe that there's going to be a return of that capital yeah. so that they can continue to then deploy capital. Yeah. Now, when I started, I talked about how the early, it's early days and what we're seeing is corporates looking at CSR okay. as the channel to support sports. And why? Because in communities today, you have youth restiveness, you have rising cases of drug use, and we're saying, look, what else can we do to support the communities where we are and operate so that things don't go belly up completely? Um, and sports is one of those areas, and that's why we're making those, you know, dip your toe in the water and see how you can support mm -hmm. and start there. Mm -hmm. Of course, there has to be some sort of elite consensus as a country. Mm -hmm. What kind of country do we want to build? Absolutely. And the point you make about, you know, holistic education going beyond just rote learning in the classroom mm -hmm. and in, in incorporating sports is something that um, I'm aware is top of mind amongst many young professionals like myself. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I was talking to a friend who is the CEO of a, tel of a tower company, a telecom mm -hmm. tower company, and one of his personal projects is essentially investing in schools mm -hmm. by going to look for um, schools that have grounds so he can then build post facilities within those schools, you know, to encourage active participation mm -hmm. of students outside of the classroom in other sports, football, handball, basketball, whatever it is. Because like you very eloquently, uh, you know, alluded to, um, sports teaches you so many things, mm -hmm. um, teaches you discipline, mm -hmm. you know, which is important for life, you know, being able to develop the commitment, understand what it means to uh, take a path of self, I will use maybe not self abnegation but just understanding what it means to sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know, certain pleasures, you know, sleeping, waking up so much earlier than maybe your friends, mm -hmm. um, for going certain kinds of meals and diets just so you maintain a certain, mm -hmm. you know, muscle to mass mm -hmm. to bone, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ratio and, you know, working out, exercising just to keep your, you know, body weight in check and to ensure that your muscles are toned. So there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. It teaches people, and you talked about all the other things around teamwork, mm -hmm. you know, collaboration, understanding mm -hmm. discipline, understanding rules and being by it, understanding what it means to fail at an attempt and knowing that, look, it's not the end of the world. You can always try again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that I participated itself is, you know, itself is a win mm -hmm. and all of that. So, um, like I said, it's, it's very early days. There's so much more we can do. Um, and... I believe that, look, as, as a community, um, you know, so when you look at co companies and corporates and businesses like ourselves, um, so we, we, we live in the community, we live in society, and we ask ourselves, what else can we do? Um, um, sports, in many cases, requires investments in infrastructure. Um, if it's um, team sports, for example, you must have, you know, befitting infrastructure that look, you know, from grounds to play, playing courts to pitches. Um, but not just the final pitch, but some training materials. You know, if you are into swimming, you must have a swimming pool at a certain um, standard, mm. uh, so that you know you you are not, quote unquote, um, um, shooting yourself in the foot when you then show up at international tournaments and you know you are not prepared because you are not training with the right 
you know, in the right environment, uh, and all of that. So it's those investments can start. Um, I know I can use an example. My kids, I have two children. My daughter is older than my son, but my son is a much better swimmer than she is. Mm. Uh, she teases him and calls him a fish, and you know he's the best swimmer in the school. He got an award for it, mm. and he just graduated. Mm. Um, but I didn't have that chance growing up because my parents did not have, you know, they were middle class, quote and unquote, mm. but I didn't have access to a swimming pool. Mm. But I always thought I could learn this thing. Mm. And the first chance I had as an adult, young, you know, employee, I went and taught myself how to swim. But clearly, I was already in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. there, there's no future for me yeah. in swimming as a sport. Now, if my kids belong to a swimming club, there's odds are there are competitions that can happen both locally and internationally, which if I can afford it, I might then decide to, you know what, commit that investment into my son. He also plays football. He's, he's, I'm sporty. I, I, I played, uh, so I played football in school. Of course, I did high jump, I did long jump. Mm -hmm. So it's naturally that my mom was also an athlete. Okay. Um, so I understand where the genetics play and he's very sporty yeah. I can like I have now decided you know what he has this there's a neighbor of mine whose son has enrolled in a football academy here in Lagos and you know he goes with him sometimes and one day the coach came to me to say look at the other boy's birthday his friend's birthday your son is very good at this football thing you should really consider enrolling him and I think to myself okay well now I know that if the talent is there I might as well support him because potentially if he goes to Europe I can become a very rich man I retire early <laughs> now but Truth is, if he was to play professionally all his life in Nigeria, mm. uh, are the odds of success as great? They are not. And truth be told, um, when you look at the numbers, at the end of the day, it's a very, very limited, very limited opportunity you know, um, window. Um, how many people make it to elite levels and become phenomenally successful at those levels, you know, barring injuries and all that? So um, it's one reason why education has to be blended with sports, mm. so that, look, if the sports thing doesn't really work out, you know, the, the kids are armed with life skills that they can then apply into different careers and make a success. So there's so much to be said, but let me rest yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I'll, I'll take you back to something you said, and, and it's about the economy. Yes. Do we have the economy to run spot? I, I, I hear people all, I ask me that all the time. Do you have an economy to run spot? Maybe you'd better, you, you're in a better place to explain this. When, when they say 1% of your GDP can come from spots, it, does, it means you don't have to have an EPL or you don't have to have a British economy to create 1% yes. in, in your economy. Yeah? So that's number one. Number two, Nigerians say there's no money. And, 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 and you know what I think? There's money, okay. but there are no products. Yeah? So I'll give you an example. The English Premier League um, has been the rave in Nigeria for the past 20 years plus, right? As of the last time that I checked, yeah, the current deal for the English Premier League broadcasting rights is, is 168 million pounds for sub-Saharan Africa. 168 million pounds, yeah? I don't want to convert to Naira <laughs> because I don't want to lose my crew. Yeah. Okay, so 168 million pounds was for, for Sub-Saharan Africa. As of 2009 and 2010, HITV was paying, HITV was paying $40 million. That's what Tony Subai himself said. That he paid $40 million. $40 million. To get the right. Absolutely. That's $40 million. In that time, the rights have doubled more than what? once. So oh, Nigeria is probably paying at this point in time somewhere in the region of a hundred million dollars just to watch the EPL. That doesn't sound like we don't have money. The money is there. What we need to then do is how do we trap that hundred million dollars in Nigeria such that even if you still want to watch the EPL, you give them ten million dollars and you put ninety million dollars in the NPFL. That's mad jobs for everyone, quality jobs. You know, so I think the challenge has to then be. If we have 100 million, I've not talked about tourism, EPL tourism. I've not talked about thousands of Nigerians, I'm sure, who are season ticket holders of their English clubs, right? So it's a lot of money that we sink into the EPL. And if you ask me, it's part of the reasons why today we're grappling with an economy that's on life support. If, we, if every time we spend the little we have on other, it's not just sports. There's tourism, there's education, there's all kinds of things. You know what I mean? We're like a basket case. So my point is, there is money. Is there a product? 
if there is no product, how do we build the product? Or what do you think? So, so um, well, I, I hear you, mm. and, and I understand the sentiment. Mm. Um, but, but there are certain, um, some of the data points are skewed. Mm. And it's important to recognize the skew. Okay, please. So when we say the EPL, that's one product. Mm. Of course, there is the Spanish La Liga, which is mm. also quite popular here. There mm. is the Italian Serie R. Maybe the okay, so used to be. The Champions League is huge. Now, all of that TV following and the rights behind it is typically um, purchased by broadcasters or people affiliated to broadcast who want to make a buck on the back mm -hmm. of that, given the huge following this mm -hmm. products mm -hmm. command, because they're their products. That said, um, if I look at the proportion of the percentage of Nigerians who have sufficient liquidity as to be able to go pay season tickets in the, for a club in the UK, maybe Chelsea or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that if I aggregate all of those individuals, there are up to 10,000 of them in Nigeria. Right? So when we then talk about creating local products as an alternative to the EPL, um, the question is, what exactly are we creating? Is it a product for Nigerians to consume? Mm. Or are we creating a product that becomes an export product? Mm. My argument mm. when I talk with friends is, as a country, yes, you know, there is always the talk about the 200 plus million Nigerians being a market. I don't think we're a market. Mm. The, predominant share of Nigeria's population is either poor, you know, um, I don't want to use the word extremely poor, but, you know, when we talk about extreme poverty, mm -hmm. there's at least 130 million Nigerians who are extremely mm -hmm. poor, less than a dollar ninety, you know, a uh, dollar and ninety cents. So that's, that's not the guy who is going to pay you money to go watch a football game. Mm -hmm. Clearly, at that level is subsistence. He just needs to eat, he needs shelter and the basics, maybe a roof over his head. Um, football becomes a luxury, or sport becomes a luxury, whether it's football or whatever, basketball. Now, if we're going to create a product, we've got to think about who are we creating the product for and can they pay? Mm. The Nigerian League, for example, where we have become a, a, a stakeholder in a sense by sponsoring um, the eventual league winners for the 2023 20, 24 mm. league season um, in Ugo Rangers. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. Mm. Um, was a decision we took because we started looking at it from a sort of social slash um, you know corporate social responsibility type lens mm. um, and it was from that perspective we sort of went into it to look what can we do to improve and help ameliorate what was a sort of dire youth situation in the southeast um, you know given the issues with insecurity mm. and all of that and the restedness mm. and that for us was the way and of course from shared sponsorship, we're now mm -hmm. talking about other areas of collaboration to mm -hmm. see how we can support that club to becoming more professionally run, mm -hmm. um, including improving the grounds. So the stadium, we're talking about, look, what would it take to upgrade these facilities to become um, at least certified for CAF competitions in Africa? Mm -hmm. So that's on the, on the way. What about your feeder teams? Are there academies affiliated to Rangers? Mm -hmm. You know, are there other clubs at the lower tiers that potentially could act as feeder clubs, what is the exchange? How do you provide that support so that they become sustainable and run efficiently? Um, you know, so those are the conversations that are already ongoing. And um, yes, um, you know, sometimes I look at the big picture and I say, look, I can't solve all the big problems yeah. at the time. Yeah. So pick one area and get in there and get involved mm -hmm. and start doing what you can in your little corner. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you inspire a few others, and I mm. talked about a few companies that have become active. I've been in the football area, mm. uh, sponsoring certain teams who are you know, either in the NFL, NPFL, or in the NNL. Mm. Now you have some corporate sponsoring that. Mm. Some cases, one company is sponsoring two different mm. clubs. So we're beginning to see investments like that. Because it's an investment, maybe not necessarily for profit, but as a, as a, as a socially responsible institution, we're seeing some of that. But Ultimately, what would be the product? The product has to be what is showcased. In this case, football has to be the league. Mm -hmm. um, the integrity of league is important. You know, mm -hmm. what, is, what is it like you know, on match days? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have decent TV coverage? Is the pitch nice? Does it look appealing? Mm -hmm. When you show up on TV, for example, uh, do you see dust each time players run around mm -hmm. and try and kick the ball? Mm -hmm. or, you know, which is all of that. You know, it all comes together. 
you know, the aesthetics has to work. The quality of the football has to work. So the coaching and the quality of coaching, the players, they, you know, some of the basics, can they trap a ball, can they put the ball on their chest, mm -hmm. you know, how technical are they, Give, yeah. in terms of gifting, you know, with their head, with both feet, mm -hmm. um, you know, so a lot of those things. Um, so it's, it's a holistic conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would posit that if we're to try and make sports a product, then we have to look at ways of exporting that product so that we're earning FX and not just hoping on the local market that is beset by so many other economic issues. Oh, okay, very well spoken. You know, that's the reason I like you guys. <laughs> you see, and let me tell you what that reason is. Look, you are Nigerian corporate, right? And you're waiting for the MPFL to become a grade before you get behind. That's not the way it works. If you want our sports to be at the, the, the European level, so, or, you know, competitive, well compared to so the best products in the world, you've got to get in now, contribute a bit, and then seek the changes that you wish to see happen in the league, like my gentleman friend here is doing um, at Afri Invest, all right? So we're going to go on a short break, about a minute or, 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 or thereabouts, uh, keep the dial on. On, on Plus TV Africa, we're reaching you live from, from our stations in Lagos. When we return, the business continues. Welcome back to the program Sports Business with Orufo Ezaga. We're reaching you live from Sport Plus TV Africa and in, from our studios in Lagos, Nigeria. We've been talking about sports investments, uh, and in the studio with me has been uh, Mr. Victor Unduka Uba. He's the Deputy Managing Director, Afri Invest West Africa. They are not just investment bankers, they are also investors in the Nigerian sports, in the Nigerian local sports space. All right? So, Victor, um, we were talking about whether there was a market for sports in Nigeria. Is there a market? And you are talking about if you need to build a sports product, you've got to think about exporting that sports product. Yeah? But then, has anybody tried, for instance, yeah, to build that? Have you had a maybe five, a plan come to you to say, you know what, over the next five, ten years, this is how we want to build this product? Because first, you have to capture the local market. Internationally, all sports businesses all sports properties have a local foundation. If, for instance, you're watching the EPL and there are 10 people in the stadium, you watch it and you think, what am I watching? Yeah? If you're watching the NBA and, and there, there are no takers, same problem. So you've got to, first of all, win the local market. And then people can watch and say, whatever these 50,000 people in the stadium are enjoying, I want a part of that. That's number one. Number two is the fact that you talked about what population of Nigerians have money to invest in, say, maybe going to a stadium and stuff like that. I'll tell you something. If you look at the 20 teams in the MPFL last season and you looked at the stadium capacity that they had, you'd find that to fill all of the stadiums one match weekend, right? As a matter of fact, not so. To fill all of the stadiums, you need 349,000 Nigerians, 349,000. But here, guess what? That's all 20 stadiums. But every match day, one team goes to play away. So effectively, what you have to do is fill 10 stadiums. Uh -huh. And all you have to do is find 174,500 Nigerians who are ready to get into the stadium and pay just an average of 2,000 naira. You know, some people will pay 500. I, when I went to watch matches last season, people were paying 25,000 naira to watch sports in Lagos. Some were paying 5,000. Do you understand? Me, I paid to myself. Do you understand? You know, so, so I know that interest is building. People are beginning to pay. For the Oriental Derby, they paid between 500 naira and 10,000 naira. Some people got in there. You know, you have to also understand the culture of the people. There's one big guy that comes in and buys 20 tickets or 50 tickets for people. So I still think that there's money. People can watch. But whatever you want to do, whatever your global ambitions are, you've got to, first of all, capture the domestic markets, right? Once you do that, we are Nigeria. 
There's a slide I would like to put up in the course of this, which will tell you that, look, Nigeria, because of Nigeria, all you have to do is look at the music industry or the movie industry and see, you know, how they have benefited from the power of the Nigerian brand. If you're a Ghanaian, you're singing, you're Sakodi. Your music is probably nice. But Chris Brown will collaborate with Risky. And the next day, 20 million people are following him. You know? So there's a certain attraction to Nigerian music because of that as well. You know what I mean? So we have the dynamics right, I think. I think we have the, the necessary dynamics. The point is, do we have the, the innovation and, the, and the, the heart to make this thing, to build this thing? Because to build them takes time. Do we have the heart to, to wait out? Do we have the patient capital we need to do that? So it's, um, it's an interesting question, mm. you know, no doubt. And, uh, and I like the, the um, parallels you drew with, you know, music mm. or uh, movies, entertainment mm. industry mm. largely. Um, and, and, you know, not, not to, not to, um, to pour water on, on that <laughs> example, you would agree with me that um, while a local following is important, mm. the real business of music or entertainment, you know, came with exports. Without a doubt. Right. Completely. So um, if we talk about Nigerian Football League, Nigerian Professional Football League or Nigerian mm. Football generally, mm. as an example now mm. discussing sports yeah. um, or as a case study, um, I, I don't think Nigerian teams lack for following. Right, you know, if if Kano Pilau has a match in Kano, it's usually a so lockdown. The north is um, you know, yeah. if Enyimba has a match in Aba, it's on lockdown. If Rangers has a match in Enyimba, it's on mm. lockdown. Sporting Lagos, which was even only newly promoted yeah. last season, uh, began to even develop a cult following amongst young yeah. professionals who wanted yeah. a different experience on mm. the weekends. And like you said, mm. people pay 10, 15, 20, 25K to go sit in the box to watch a game with family. Mm. You know, so it's about the experience and Depending on the market where you are, you will be able to get some of that uh, product sold to some consumers. So the following is there. Now, to make Nigerian football, for example, a thriving multinational business, it, the product has to be such that everybody wants to be part of it. Players from around the continent who want to play in the country. Mm. The, the, the best coaches around will want to coach in that league. Um, you know, if you're a sports scientist, you're a, a medical professional within sports, you know, a physio, a surgeon, you want to be part of that ecosystem. You know, um, if you, you, then you're a brand, you recognize the power of that product and then you want it for mileage, mm. you know. So it is, I think that the journey has begun. You know, I've cited examples, yeah. there's Vendis, there's, um, you know, Bet King, yeah. um, or Bet Niger rather, yeah. who, you know, um, and the people behind it, um, you know, sponsoring two different teams. Mm. You've got, um, you know, Fola and his people in Sporting Lagos, although unfortunately they are relegated. Uh, but I believe very strongly that it's it's not a. So that business, for example, was found was was or the whole idea behind Sporting Lagos was a couple of young men who had made money from tech and decided, look, we have to also find a way to enable something in the community and give back and that was their way of doing it and they're not here they're not playing games um, i think they lost the stadium they had the 5000 seater mm. to the whole um, you know the, to the lucky coastal road mm. uh, but they're not deterred because i spoke with them i said look you know what they've taken it on the chain and they're prepared to continue so so you see when you talk about those investments you know the macro always tells yeah. now they could have decided you know what but done. Yeah. We've lost that investment. Mm -hmm. Let's go and face our business. Mm -hmm. But they're still committed. So you'll find that there is that. It's a long, it's a long game, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to keep at it. Um, ultimately, we, we can talk about the local following and getting people to pay tickets. But at the end of the day, um, and football, as we know, um, when we look at some of the clubs that we like to follow in Europe, um, they, 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 they prepare accounts. They give you the revenue sources that at least three, potentially four of them, get tickets is one. And it's, in many cases, it's actually the least of, of, the, of, yeah. the, of the lot. More money from TV, mm -hmm. depending on competitions they play, mm -hmm. um, and then there's merchandising, right? So if you ask who is the star player in the local league, in a particular team, mm -hmm. uh, does he have a commercial appeal that people are willing to go pay to buy his jersey? Um, how, what is the framework for distributing jerseys, mm -hmm. um, you know, and ensuring the authenticity? 
would they be plagiarized or you know uh, would there be counterfeiting in that market you know would the clubs derive the revenue you know and then there's all of the other things around you know um branding so branding local stadium you know um, branding local events you know in the name of the stadium and things like that so those are things that contribute to the revenues for nigeria there's some tv money coming through but it's not a lot um, the, the MPFL has put some money down. League winner gets, I think, it was 100 million last year. Now it's going to 150. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. you know, sorry, 150 is going to 200. So it's nice, but even 150 million is barely a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That is some players' weekly wages in Europe. Mm -hmm. So you can't yes. divorce the reality of the economics mm -hmm. from the business you're trying to build. So it has to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Private sector. Private companies will work in the economy to try and grow, but we need the economy to also grow to the point where those businesses and opportunities become real opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's a long game. It's it's work in progress. Um, as long as the commitment is there, you know, and people don't give up, then we will just have to keep pushing and you know going at it. Mm. Well, I like what you say about the fact that the journey has begun. Yes. Right? Um, before now, it's been stop, start, stop, start. Um, I'm hoping that with the entrance of your, co your competitor, GTI Asset Management and Trust, um, into, the, into the space, the football space, um, maybe uh, they can take this thing where, where it should go. And as part, when it comes to the money in sports, like you rightly said, we're looking at TV revenues as, the, as about like between 50 and 60% of, of your income. Uh, we're looking at sponsorships, partnerships. We're looking at merchandising, gate receipts, and match day commerce, and all of that. But the point is, I, th I think that ultimately, what needs to be done, what we need to do, um, is to is to sit down and figure out whether if we get a product and develop it in the manner that we should, yeah, uh, in a manner that makes it look good. It doesn't have to be football. Everybody's trying to do it. It can be a street soccer event, you know, you go there, you film it, film it to maybe 2,000 people want to watch it, they pre they're prepared to pay 500 and you put it on the Propel Sports Africa platform and you have a business, you know what I mean? So sometimes I don't think we need to overthink this thing and feel like we have to develop an NBA grid uh, product or an NFL or an EPL or a La Liga, no. The little things that we do here that because if you go to golf, or you go to swimming, or you go to tennis in Nigeria, the people in those communities enjoy the tennis that they play, enjoy the golf that they play, and they have their own stars, they have their own stories to tell. All we need to do, as I tell to them all of the time, is take these stories from your community and plant it where the rest of Nigerians can, can see it. And maybe they get as excited as you, and they want to pay a dime or two to be part of that experience. All right? But let me um, ask about, about your partnership with Rangers, because I think that's very important. You know, it's something that you guys are doing that um, um, made me start to chase you. The other hand, <laughs> because on this program, it's very important. Our business, our focus is to get people yeah. to see the value in sports and to, and, and to then invest in sports. Because like you have said, it then cleans up society um, in a way that makes our civilization a progressive one. Yeah. All right. So, the Rangers experience. What? How's it going? Um, and what are you looking forward to in the new season? Right. So, um, thank Sorry, you. before you answer that, right. let me just. Is it, are you going to take credit for the championship win or? <laughs> well, we have to. <laughs> we, it will be remiss of us not to take the credit. But of course, um, the credit goes to, to the, the team. Because um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the players did the business uh, yeah. over 38 games, right? Mm -hmm. um, and across several cities in the country. Mm -hmm. So we can only say, well, we, we played a part in supporting that vision to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will sort of roll back a bit to a question you asked earlier um, about having. A, a, a strategy around creating a product mm. and working towards that. Mm. Rangers came to light um, in 2016 when he, there was a gentleman, I can't remember his name now, came Amobi. into our office. No, Amobi. Okay. There was some other gentleman. Okay. Um, he had a business plan that he was pitching um, or he had pitched to the 
MPFL at the time with NFF, who had said, look, okay, let's try and make our league a proper product. And the idea was, look, if you can find maybe half, for half the number of teams in the league, corporate sponsors to come in and support those, comp those, those clubs, um, then we can start off. And so he reached out to us at the time and discussed partnership options or sponsorship options. And uh, one of the teams that came up was Rangers. And I said, okay, let's look at it. So the conversation started many years ago, 2016 to be precise, uh, with Rangers. Unfortunately, at the time, we really couldn't close. Um, we couldn't get to sign the dotted lines and to proceed with that, that partnership. Um, and then Dow back last year, a movie had returned from Switzerland where he had gone to do a FIFA master and said, look, mm -hmm. He reached out to us, I knew you guys, because he was at the club at the time, we were having those conversations, mm -hmm. and said, look, are you guys still open to this idea? Um, I have a plan I want to execute. Um, and then he came and made a presentation to the management team at one of our retreats, and mm -hmm. we said, okay, you know what, um, let's dip our toe in the water and support you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we took the dive. Now, it wasn't, it, it, we could have made the decision quickly because we had been thinking about it in the past, yeah. right? So it was easy to make that call. Um, and of course, in partnering, um, the objective wasn't really, at the time, anything big or trying to say, look, I'm trying to, you know, this is about marketing and pushing our brand out there. It was really around um, how can we support what is a fan favorite in a community that is challenged um, to see how we can pull community together, pull youth together, and let them coalesce around something that they all love and enjoy, which is football, um, make it more appealing. Um, of course. Part of that sponsorship money goes towards, for example, getting the team to match their venues on time in, in a bit more comfort than they're used to, mm. um, and supporting them generally around the things they needed to do to just ensure that they were able to show up, you know, in the right frame of mind to play games and win games. Um, and thankfully, um, while the view or the idea or the hope was that, okay, within the first three years, um, maybe we could win the league. That was what a movie had sold. Mm -hmm. with, you know, where for you know, fortuitously, turns out that in the very first attempt, mm -hmm. um, first league attempt, first year of the of the partnership, Rangers won the league. Mm -hmm. um, so it's. Okay. So in the euphoria of the win, you know, we ask ourselves, okay, so what next, right? Um, this has come immediately. Of course, Rangers is now going to be playing continental football, um, you know, representing Nigeria in the CAF Champions League. Um, that has obvious implications for logistics and logistic costs. Mm. Um, whereas, for the last year, any local tra any travel it was within Nigeria was local. In some cases, they go by bus, mm. um, you know, and it was therefore much cheaper. Now, every game that is away requires you to procure flight tickets mm. for the entire team, Expensive players and coaches, tickets. and especially today, given where dollar prices are, mm. you know, so, and then you've got to make hotel reservations, get them into, you know, make reservations for grounds, for training, you know, maybe host teams might pro provide training facilities, but, you know, you must take certain things, you know, um, and given the nature of, you know, you can't be naive on the continent, mm. you can't go and shop and then they serve you food and water, mm. you've got to take some provisions yourself so that, you know, nobody comes and, you know, suddenly team develop, have the team develop stomach ache and can't play the game. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be smart about it. Mm -hmm. um, your stadium also has to tick the box in terms of quality so that you can host your games, you know, because CAF has certain minimums, mm -hmm. you know. So that requires investments in, uh, you know, the in facilities to improve the quality. You know, we, we saw what happened at the last rental derby when Inuba came to play Rangers mm -hmm. in Enugu and how there was the pitch invasion and yeah. all that. And both sides were fine, but yeah. clearly it's an infrastructure question. Yeah. Uh, so some investments have to be made, you know, around perimeter, you know, fencing, yeah. um, you know, the OB van, um, you know, p improving the quality of the VIP sitting and mm. providing some proper boxes uh, and all of that so that the experience is even better. Mm. So there is quite some work to be done, but I think it's been a very productive and very fruitful uh, partnership in the very first year. Mm. Um, it's also done some good for us in terms of brand recognition within Inugu State mm. generally, um, even, even where the brand is quite, um, you know, it's become a very household name in the South. Oh, and wow. there's very positive affiliation with the brand because okay. it's seen as the guys who helped the team, you know, win the league, wow. you know, yeah. um, for the eighth time, yeah. you know, of asking. Okay. I think that on, we have to bring this home now. Yes. Because, um, there's a video that we, we played earlier that I would like you to see. Um, yes, this is basically, I just want to show the sort of raw emotions 
that that um, sports evoke in, pe in, in people. Absolutely. And this was during so the Nations Cup. The Nations Cup. So the student hostel. This mm -hmm. is school hostel, you know, and this lady is going absolute bonkers, you know, for the Super Eagles. You yes. Know? If you could get this sort of emotions to the domestic scene, right? And this, it's not like this is far fetched because even during the Oriental Derby, people went really crazy. Do you get? Once you can evoke this kind of emotion, the guy in Ghana wants to see what these people are going crazy about. The person, the African in in London, in the US, you know, they, they want to know what's Bene. going on. Do you understand? You'll be surprised. Maybe even more than Nigerians. Yeah. You know? So what we need to do is try and see how to. Fundamental to build, building the products that we're talking about is that you've got to have stars. Right. Because it's right. the stars that the fans for. You have to platform them. Yeah, and you have to pay them to be stars. You will pay them real good money. It's not like you're doing them a favor. You're building your business. Do you understand? So these are the things that we need to bring into our sports space. But I think what the problem is right now is that everybody is waiting for the one successful um, um, case study or whatever like before they, they all jump in. Do you understand? So on on a final note, are you optimistic about about what um, what what our sports industry, uh, the future of our sports industry is? Yes, I am quite optimistic. You know, um, like I said, there is something about the African and sports that is almost very naturally set up. Mm. Um, so, to that extent, we're, we're, we're quite optimistic. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, optimism is really the only thing we can hold on to, you know, and, and keep investing because um, the talent is there. Um, harnessing it is important and except you know we commit to this sort of initiatives and processes we really can't give hope to those guys yeah. and so we have to be there yeah. um, and I think uh, increasingly you know there are other there are other friends of the firm who've seen us and said to us oh, guys look, this was interesting this was yeah. exciting yeah. Um, and we are then saying look why don't you also then Join. consider joining and coming along so that we can collectively you know, so um, in local parlance, they say one person, you know, one person peace in no go form, but if you got that peace, you go plenty. <laughs> so we're hoping that the more, you know, teams can come to, no corporates can come together to, you know, pick, adopt teams, um, you know, in whatever sports, you know, yeah. then the, the merit becomes. And, you know, we can then create an ecosystem that is more sustainable, sustainable. for everyone. All right. Thank you very much, Victor. Final question, yes or no answer. If somebody's watching now and they have a sports business idea, is Afri Invest open to listening, hearing them out? Yes. Okay. So, ladies and um, so viewers, so um, you, we've come to the end of our program. It's been an um, enlightening session with Mr. Victor Ndukawa, who is the DMD of Afri Invest West Africa. Next week, we're going to have another loaded package for you, and we're inviting you to make this program a, a staple. You know, so that if you're in the sports business space. There's plenty you can, you can learn from it. Who knows? It could open the doors to your next big billion naira idea. Thank you for, for honoring the invitation. My pleasure. All right. Until we meet again next week, uh, this is me before, as I got saying, be productive, be good. <laughs>